Thank you. I don't think we have too much more to contribute to the discussion. The Director General has set the scene quite eloquently for ourselves, as well as the, uh, the previous panelists, including the, um, uh, the Canadian Minister. I uh, just wanted to add, uh, together with my colleague from the Department of Migration Management, that across its multiple assistance and protection activities, IOM, of course, is confronted with many migrant stories, profiles, and sometimes tragedies all part of a reality of human mobility which has little to do with the manner in which contemporary migration is often caricatured across a plethora of fora. While we all recognize that migrants are most often positive agents of today's modern and interconnected worlds, and as such are not intrinsically vulnerable, and I think we'll go back to that throughout the next two days, it is also true that many are confronted with various challenges, a situation born out of the complex set of factors that bring them to leave in the first place, as well as, most critically, the conditions they face along migratory routes, particularly when those are irregular. Many of the migrants that Iowa meets and assists along their migratory journeys face severe abuses of their fundamental rights through human trafficking, forced labor, other forms of exploitation, inhumane treatments, physical and psychological abuse, loss of resources, family separation, and the list goes on. As the Director General stated earlier this morning, as well as the President of the General Assembly, the New York Declaration and the subsequent development of a global compact uh, for safe, orderly, and regular migration present us with an opportunity to leave no one behind. Through the New York Declaration, you member states have committed to upholding the human rights of all migrants, irrespective of their migratory or legal status, and to addressing their immediate needs upon reception, and this without discrimination. More specifically, the New York Declaration, under the provisions for migrants, indicates the need to work towards and commit to guiding principles consistent with international law on the treatment of migrants in vulnerable situations, and the recognition that some might not qualify for return and thus require forms of alternative protection. Having recalled these key commitments, I would like to highlight some of the elements emerging from the situations in which migrants find themselves, which we hope will also help guide the agenda of these next two days. So I think I'll have to depart from tradition. I have six points to make. Um, first, within the context of this gathering, and more largely within the context of human mobility, Vulnerability is defined as vulnerability to violence, exploitation, abuse, and rights violations during the migratory process. In other words, at departure, while in transit, and on arrival. And not necessarily, and it's an important point, I think, as a predetermined condition. Second, vulnerability is not inherent to migrants, as I just stated. It is the result of many factors and their interplay. These factors can be multiple. It can be the social, social demographic characteristics of the individuals, but also the social, economic, environmental, and political elements of the context which migrants come from or travel through. These factors largely influence migrants' capacities too. They also include the external disruptive factors induced or resulting from migration, such as loss of resources, family separation, loss of livelihoods. And finally, the physical environment in which they find themselves at a particular moment, be that a camp, a shelter, detention or retention centers, border areas, and so on. It is critical, therefore, to analyze how these factors influence the condition of migrants in any given context in order to define what constitutes vulnerabilities. Third, to the issue of women and children. Migrant women and children are not vulnerable by definition, but their potential situation of vulnerability is defined by other critical factors and their impact on the concerned individuals. Surely age, sex, gender, sexual orientation are some of the defining elements which have an, in fact, an impact on vulnerability. And some sessions of the agenda uh, will, we hope, explore in depth some other defining factors of these characteristics. Fourth, there are challenges linked to the identification of these situations of vulnerability. Multiple examples of best practices will be presented throughout the next two days, including in relation to individual screening and triage practices, 
as well as states' existing responses to some of the most frequently occurring situations of vulnerability. There is certainly a need to undertake a more concerted effort to track such best practices more systematically and consider replicating them in contexts that are facing or are prone to crisis situations of all type. As a result of individual screening, migrants in a vulnerable situation could perhaps, for example, be granted alternative or temporary forms of protection on the basis of policies that seek to prevent migrants from being returned or denied entry, this based on the particular circumstances they have faced along their migratory journey. And the Director General highlighted some of these uh, options earlier on. My fifth point is in regards to our hope that the IDM will also present us with an opportunity to stress the agency and resilience of migrants. Migrants are the ultimate enablers of their own solutions. States and other key stakeholders are increasingly recognizing, indeed, the need to leverage this agency, empower migrants, and through effective integration and inclusion approaches, reduce the risks they are exposed to. Those fundamental principles are largely recognized and acknowledged in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable, sustainable Development. IOM is particularly keen on stressing the progressive nature of many of the solutions that migrants have access to, solutions which should ultimately be driven to the extent possible by migrants themselves. Lastly, I want to recall the existence of some effective guidelines and policy dialogues which have produced practical guidance of relevance to this topic. I think the Director General mentioned this this morning, we're not starting from a blank page. There is a history prior to the New York Declaration last year. Those initiatives include the Migrants in Countries in Crisis Initiative, through which a group of like-minded member states led by the Philippines and the United States contributed to identifying assistance and protection options for migrants caught in countries experiencing crises. Other such examples include the Regional Conference on Migration, the Puebla Process, which focuses on migration policy and management in Central America, the United States and Canada, or more recently, um, Global Migration Group efforts supported by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, efforts which I think will be discussed in a separate uh, panel session uh, in the next couple of days. The message I'd like to close with is that there already exists a comprehensive legal framework grounded on human rights law and an increasingly rich set of practical examples and guidelines governing the protection and assistance to migrants in vulnerable situations. What is missing is a systematic link between policy and practice between rhetoric and the grim realities IOM and its partners face across the world in multiple settings, from the shores of the Mediterranean Sea to the deserts of this world. The link between isolated efforts and global systematic approaches. The development of the Global Compact now is our chance to seize this momentum, foster cooperation and complementarity. We are confident that these next two days will bring value to this debate and provide some concrete recommendations to the benefit of all migrants. Thank you, Mr. Swing. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Now I'll give the floor to An Nguyen, who is the head of our Migrant Assistance Division. An. DG Swing, uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to set up, uh, to help set up the scene for the next two days. Um, the topic of addressing migrant vulnerabilities is something that is personally close to my heart, but is also at the core of IOM's work. Um, our understanding of vulnerability results from our own operational experiences and lessons learned, sometimes successful and sometimes not so successful. Uh, but to date, um, IOM has assisted over 90,000 trafficked persons uh, through our 10 regional uh, migrant assistance and protection programs in partnership with governments and CSOs, over 65,000 migrants in vulnerable situations benefited from direct assistance services in 2016. Beneficiaries included victims of exploitation, violence and abuse, as well as others in vulnerable situations. So what did we learn? Our work relies on existing protection frameworks to uphold uh, rights of migrants, as, as Vincent mentioned. However, the problem 
if I can reiterate, is that existing protection frameworks and standards are sometimes difficult to operationalize and are therefore not fully implemented. If I could be bold to say, sometimes they're simply not well applied. Uh, take, for example, Article 16 uh, that, that talks about protection and assistance in the smuggling protocol, which in practice is rarely referenced. Between 2015 and 2017, IOM um, surveyed over 22,000 migrants who had traveled the eastern and central Mediterranean routes. Over a third of, of the individuals interviewed answered positively to one of the indicators of trafficking and other exploitative practices, with many reporting direct experiences of abuse, exploitation, and practices which may amount to human trafficking. The findings provide strong evidence of predatory behavior by smugglers and traffickers and the kinds of enabling environments in which trafficking and associated forms of exploitation and abuse thrive along the migra uh, migration routes. Um, as a practical response, uh, currently we are working on an operational approach to analyzing and responding to migrate, migrant vulnerabilities to improve the way we identify and to assist migrants in need. Um, identification and migrant vulnerabilities will be discussed in panel two. Uh, to further uh, detail Vincent's remarks uh, that vulnerabilities are not necessarily inherent in a migrant, uh, the approach looks at examining factors at the individual, household, community, structural, and situational levels to better help identify and describe vulnerabilities. We see factors as either risk factors or protective. This means that we're not only looking at deficits, but also at strengths and capabilities that can help mobilize and, and build upon to improve resilience to the risk factors. Panel five will discuss this, where we'll be promoting resilience and, uh, and agency and support of vulnerable migrants. And the, this will give you an opportunity to further discuss risk and productive or protective factors in the context of migration. By the end of the year, uh, we hope to release a handbook on protection and assistance to migrants in situations of vulnerability for practitioners, and this will include a training curriculum. But part of that process um, also includes forming and dialoguing with, uh, with uh, other actors, uh, which includes UN agencies such as OHCHR, ILO, UNODC, UNICEF, and UNHCR. Uh, we're also developing and field testing operational tools to accompany the handbook, including the screening tools for identification and referral of migrants in vulnerable situations. And we will continue to conduct research and studies in order to be evidence-based in our responses. Ladies and gentlemen, as practice informs policy and policy improves practice, um, I hope that our operational approach may also contribute to the global discussion and policy discussions, uh, which will be discussed in panel three. Finally, uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on how to operationalize the protection of migrants in vulnerable situations in the context of the Global Compact on Migration during panel six. DG, Swing, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to address this plenary. And I wish us all a lively, thoughtful, and fruitful discussion in the coming two days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ann and Vincent. Uh, I think now I'd like to ask the moderator and the panelists for the first panel to come forward and take their places here at the podium. Thank you very much.